the North Sea and England's East Coast, the lonely coast, the quiet coast. Once it was the noisy coast, the raiders' coast, the invaders' coast, where Saxon and Viking waded ashore and the din of the Dark Ages was loudest. But in the end, out of these shapeless centuries, the English nation took shape. And as England grew up, she turned her back on the North Sea. Her future was to be found in the Atlantic and beyond. And that is how history left the North Sea behind, how this shore returned to peace and quiet, and how the sea Hengist and Horsa crossed became a herring pond. And so even the invaders stopped coming. A thousand years of watches and no callers. A thousand beaches and no beachhead. A thousand years, and then the Victorians with their piers and proms, making the shore into the front, turning the sea into the seaside. No Coney Island, though, no Saint Tropez. The posters call it bracing, and that's about the best you can say. And the sea? The sea bewildered by the muddle of ridges and troughs and fronts, the barometric anarchy of England's weather. Then suddenly the fine day, the flag of truce which no one trusts. Down on the foreshore where old ships sleep, where wrecks rust and the slow sea unpicks each steel stitch. Up on the cliff where sailors sleep, everything affirms the malice of this spiteful sea. The coast is not all solitude. There are big ports, towns, Yarmouth, Grimsby, Hull and the rest. And further north, from Tees to Tyne, the muck and brass of big industry. Most of this is inland. On the shore itself, only one industry counts for much. So time has changed Viking boat for fishing boat, and Norseman for trawlerman. Today, these are the Vikings of the herring pond, and the plunder they bring back will make fish fingers for supermarkets. So time has changed everything, everything but the sea, where the long ships once came in on the long swell. sea to its thousand millibar depressions and its force eight winds. Except that there is one thing to add, a new thing. This is how the East Coast first saw it. Dawn, July 1966. Big journeys begin with one step. And this strange flotilla, pipe-laden barges, tugs, floating crane, assembling off Yorkshire, is an early step in a journey which will lead through the 1960s and 70s, and who knows how far beyond.
same dawn, same coast. Sequest, offshore drilling platform, nearing the end of an 800 mile tow. Nine months earlier, another offshore rig, Sea Gem, drilling 42 miles east of the Humber, had struck the first North Sea gas. And then, within three months, tragedy. Sea Gem capsized and sank in 90 feet at the scene of her triumph. Now Sea Quest will continue where Sea Gem started, at a point on a chart in Block 48, Square 6, 42 miles off Grimsby. Gas search, like oil search, is a mixture of the systematic and the accidental, an exact science with its fingers crossed. And Sequest is its newest creation, the latest in movable rigs, made to hunt needles in the seismic haystack. We're over gas, but how much? The driller is a blind man. The drill is his stick. By drilling, he feels for the edges of the gas field as the blind man feels for the curb. So Sequest drills, rig in the wind and feet in the sea, through a slim tube into the seabed and into two miles of rock below that. When a gas field has been proved, fixed platforms take over from movable rigs. From here, they will drill again and again, exploiting the discovery to its fullest. And later, the platforms will remain to control the producing wells. Fixed platform, movable rig, life is much the same. Each tiny well preoccupied with its own problems and schedules. Each an iron atoll of catwalks and gantries and girders wide open to the punch of the wind. They live on stilts, high above the swing of the sea, with the wind over them, and the waves under them. On deck, a drilling rig. Below deck, like the underside of some prodigious pier. helicopter eats 40 miles for breakfast. He is milkman, postman, paperboy, ferry, bus and bum boat. Every man goes ashore every 10 days. The chopper comes and goes, taking out the gleeful, bringing in the rueful. And if it's not your turn, you just get on with your job. Back on the Yorkshire coast, the pipe is ashore. The first ever North Sea gas line, which will put a shot of millions of cubic feet a day into England's arm. But this is only a first step. The undersea pipe is still to be laid. 45 miles, and the North Sea will make them long miles. 
strange transformation from trawlers and colliers into science fiction. Yesterday, dirty British coaster. Today, automated pipe ship. Seven p.m. The last chopper lifts off, and we raise the drawbridge. Forty-five miles away, it's theatre time, or dining out time, or slippers by the fire time. Here, it's just shift change time. These are oil men, and they've been around. They've worked the top of the Rockies and the bottom of the Persian Gulf. Now they're working their own backyard. Home is spitting distance. Not that it makes much odds, sitting out here on an iron stool, where all you have of England is England's weather. Strange place. Outdoors, wild as a cliff top. Indoors. Silent as a submarine. Strange life. Neither ship nor shore. Not quite construction camp, nor sea voyage, nor even space station. Yet something of all these. No seabed is a bargain basement. Once you leave the shore. Every difficulty is tenfold, every operation slower, every cost higher, every risk bigger, every involvement deeper. And of all seas, this one never parted easily with anything. Dawn. September 1966. The pipe laying vessel enters block 48, square six. This strange circuit of iron islands. At one of these, the rendezvous will be made. The first historic hookup between Britain, 45 miles away, and North Sea gas from two miles down. For over half a century, over half the world, the British have looked for fuel. And all the time it was here, at the back doorstep, under the old herring pond. Gas in quantity, less than 50 miles from 50 million people. Today, the North Sea is a chessboard of concessions on which play has barely begun. These rigs are some of its kings and castles. And this same surly sea that wet Canute is the setting for the biggest industrial gamble in Europe's history. So now the herring pond has bigger fish to fry. And Britain's backwater, by one of time's twists, comes once more into the mainstream of events. 